we jumped right into this episode, so I just wanted to give some introductions of who is speaking on here. We have Tom Parent, who's the Executive Director of Operations and Administration at St. Paul Public Schools. And then we have Meg Parsons, who is a principal at Cunningham, and Heidi Newmuller, who is an associate principal at Cunningham, both in the greater Minneapolis-St. Paul area. This is a really interesting episode because it really hits kind of those three different buckets that we always talk about on the show. We were talking about how leadership, pulling in the community and kind of getting into uh, beyond the walls of of the schools. And then obviously we talk about space. So uh, this is a really good episode to go through and uh, listen all the way through the end where we have a call to action that you can have at the end at betterlearningpodcast.com. If we talk about stories, one of the really true success stories, I think Heidi was the Bruce Vento community engagement piece, um, because that really took us to a different level with that community. And the focus was on wellness. And, you know, I just think that that is a story that I would love to highlight to this audience, because it took us a while to get there through this process. Well, and it builds on the preceding decade worth of work and yeah. uh, through line of stakeholder engagement and what are we actually asking? Right. Well, that's a perfect, perfect place to start. Let's hear like, how did that one start? Tom, you want to start? I think, I think we need to start at the beginning. I I think the big thing is really the emphasis of what we were trying to accomplish. And this dates back to what, 2014, Tom, uh, with the master plan. And, you know, I think it's always been given that when you do a facility master plan, like warm, safe, dry, et cetera, is, is, that's a given. But this was really about um, a transformation of the district. Um, it was about aligning the facilities to their strategic plan and creating places for, for kids to learn and for teachers to teach. Um, and that emphasis is very different than many dis- districts, I think that I've worked with in my in my career. So as we think about what's important to the district, it really is about how do they reach out to folks? The community engagement process was very rich. Um, you know, we, we did have kind of a district-wide steering committee, but we um, the district also reached out to all the constituents. Definitely want to hear from the district perspective, Tom, like why do you think that was even there? Like. How, how did the district decide they even wanted to go about it and, and engage the community? You know, I, I think the way that that manifested in our facilities master plan was actually the culmination of some preceding work about um, generally how do big organizations make informed stakeholder centric decisions that didn't have anything to do with facilities. I think the facilities master plan was our first opportunity to try and take it to scale um, and be intentional about what are the pieces we are predefining as a, at a strategic level, at a technical level? What are the things that are the givens into a process that only school district leadership can speak to? And what are the pieces that we need the community to help understand and flush out um, and have real voice in, in the process? So being able to be overt and explicit about how, wh- what level of engagement and what are the promise we're making to our public um, how are those things manifesting in a process that that didn't have a, a presupposed outcome? You know, I think walking into our master planning process, we didn't have an expectation that the goal would become so transformational in its scale and aspir- and, and hope. Um, you know, we walked into the master planning assuming we would spend the same amount of money that we've been spending for the last 20 years um, on our facilities management and, and improvement. And we ended up quadrupling it. Um, because we saw the opportunity, the community got excited. They really had the opportunity to shape what that could be and how that manifested across 73 very different campuses um, in a way to, to make this real based on a common set of beliefs and principles. So it was a way for us to take this to scale in a way that folks were initially not sure how their voice would matter um, and find a way to show um, the way, the the power that comes when a lot of really smart and compassionate people get together to talk about something. So Tom, when you were going through that, was that something that the district kind of already identified or was that something that Meg and Heidi, you guys were involved with with Cunningham have helped kind of facilitate that 
uh, I'm always, and the reason I'm asking is I'm always curious because whenever we look at projects or like major initiatives, there always seems to be one person that is like that original change agent. And so I, I don't know. Uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, what was that initial spark to say, this is where we're going? You know, I, what, what I appreciate about working for the school district and having a lot of great partners is um, this is not something that is just one superintendent or one facilities director or one firm led. Um, you know, this was something where we were building over almost a decade leading up to the point where we showed the value in being thoughtful um, and strategic about how our facilities furthered the mission of the school district to show the technical components and the rigor behind those and yet how they still needed that additional layer of um, strategic vision and community aspiration. So, you know, for me, um, being able to insert at the time in this process where we were really beginning to start to understand what it was going to take for a school district to be relevant for the next generation of learners. Um, all the pieces had sort of been in place and, you know, this was an opportunity to come in and um, take a lot of great thought partners like Cunningham and um, the strategic direction of the superintendent at the time into a way that then became very distributed in its, in its articulation and impact. So, you know, we had one firm helping us do sort of the high level district level framework, and then six firms doing essentially smaller master planning for each little subsection of the district so that no one person or agency owned the whole thing. It was a, um, a group of sort of professional peers and thought partners and folks that were helping to push and prod each other into thinking differently and bigger um, across a system that was focused on um, equity um, in a way that was going to lead to different results, no matter how we we parceled out the work and what we came up with. So I think that that's the big word is equity, um, because actually Cunningham had done a, a facility assessment project for the district prior to Tom being the uh, facility director. Um, and at the time we had pushed for master planning because once you do the facility assessment, it's no good if it just sits on the shelf. Um, and really, I think that idea of how is it that we bring equity across the district with facilities that were of many different ages and different, um, had, that had different abilities to serve their students. Um, that's when, the, when things came into focus, in my opinion, um, Tom, when the master planning started. And I came in on the implementation side. So um, what I thought was really um, uh, helpful was that that um, master plan set a, um, designed a set of facilities, visioning and principles in which would create that equity amongst all of the schools. Um, and so we were given a set of defined parameters that each uh, school, each design team that was then given the projects to implement was, was to follow so that because each site is different, each school community is different. And so there was then additional community engagement that needed to occur to understand what was you know, important or special about each of those individual schools. We were all guided by those facility design principles set up by the master plan. Right, and, and Cunningham wasn't the only firm that was doing the implementation. So we helped them with the uh, master plan and setting those parameters as Heidi described them. But um, this was, this was a, as Tom put it, a very big effort on the school district's part and was very inclusive of a lot of folks. Well, that helps set the context, Meg, Heidi. I appreciate kind of giving that that idea because it, it reminds me of the whole story or you hear all the time of like an overnight success. You show me any overnight success and I'll show you 10 years of hard work <laughs> that, that got them to that point. And it, it sounds like that was kind of that, that foundation that was there. That was a lot of years in, the, in working to get it set up that way. I know we were talking, if, if there was like one project or one that we can kind of talk an example about that can give it a little more like detail, if we were going to tell the listeners a story, is there a certain school or a certain project that would be a good one for us to talk through? You know, one of the things that was been, that's been important for us in the, from the school district perspective is maintaining that continuity of intentionality around the evolution of design and the role of stakeholders in that design. So, so, so for us being, um, maintaining the common set of values. So, so we, as a school district, we use the International Association of Public Participation um, 
uh, system and guidelines. So being able to have a language around what's our intention with community voice um, and how does that articulate when we're talking big district level goals to individual campus visioning to actual project implementation. So you get those three different scales um, of, of um, process and thought and that deepening of that what, what does that design do? What does it mean? Um, how do folks engage with it? And each one of those is going to look a little bit differently. Um, you know, for us, being able to look at this as, um, I'll say the the Bruce Vento project is a good example where, um, you know, it was uh, a way to start with a vision that as we got deeper and deeper into it, um, some of our some of our initial goals and assumptions got challenged, and a way for us to think about you know, what's the right stewardship moment for this building and this community, um, recognizing that some of the challenges seem to be bigger and the impact we were going to have was less and less. So being able to take a step back and with community, be able to say, are we, are we still on the right track or are we, do we need to reassess at this point? So this went from, uh, you know, a major, largely mechanically focused um, re-envisioning of a um, 1970s era building was that Meg? Am I am I correct? I'm. Yeah, it's yeah. it was it was a brutalistic, yeah, heavy duty concrete thing with I don't know how many levels, Heidi. Thirteen different levels. Thirteen different. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So yeah. so being able to with take ramped this, all the way. Yeah. Uh, so being able to take this and say, you know, are we are we going to have the impact on learning that we think we have? We're going to have the benefit to kids that we think we can have. And as the answer became more and more gray. Um, there was the ability to step back and say, you know, let's look at our vision, principles, and values um, and be able to say, is this the right money long-term? Is this the right impact long-term? And the answer became no. And we started to look for the first time, certainly in my tenure with the school district, but um, in several decades prior to that, to um, look at ground-up construction. And then the mandate changes again to say, well, if that's the opportunity, we really have to be intentional about the good we're going to have, the 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 stewardship we're going to propose, um, and the community voice we're going to get in the process. So is that where you landed? Is that you ended up taking taking that, and so would you demolish it and build a new one, or what? what like what? Well, not yet. What happened from that? <laughs> oh, what was the next thing then? So we're we we're in um, construction documents right now, and um, but the, I think just to be clear, we did we started the Bruce Vento project with the full intention of replacing the mechanical systems and updating the existing building. What we found in the process was that structurally we couldn't handle uh, mechanical stuff on the roof. Um, there was very little daylight in the learning areas. This was designed as an open school and it was just not gonna function well for them. So we then did some feasibility studies and the district made this decision. Um, but Heidi, you've really been leading the effort on the new facility and the design of the new facility. Maybe you want to talk more about that? Well, I think, um, thank you, Meg. I think one of the things that really struck me was when we received the RFP, uh, part of the RFP said to help was to, to help the district understand um, what sustainable metric or goal or system, if any, should be utilized. And one thing that struck me um, Tom, in our first meeting to understand, you know, what the goals were, you said, wait a minute, we can't, we can't make any of these decisions, whether it's LEED or, um, you know, Living Building Challenge or Green Pedals, you know, there's, there's a whole host of different green building systems that you could use. And Tom said, hold on, we can't make a decision for the community. We really need the community's input. Actually, what we really need is how do we get from here to there to understand what the community's priorities are? And of course, as a, as a design team, we're trying to hit all the metrics for schedule, right? And so here I'm thinking, how do we, how do we get the community's input and still maintain the schedule of like, okay, we need to open by fall of 2025. And so we actually had to rethink our, our kind of traditional toolkit of how we engage the community. And what we ended up doing was created like a fair type um, atmosphere for our community workshop. And so typically we have you know, three, maybe maybe three meetings and we break down the scale of the, the questions we're asking in engagement with the community um, to understand what their priorities are. Um, but we're also working hand in hand with the Bruce Vento community. And, and what we heard is that, look, people are busy. It's post COVID. Um, we don't have six hours, you know, in three different meetings to attend and, 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 and how, 
you know, building upon that, how will the, the community even understand what you're asking? You know, these are very technical questions. So we broke down, um, you know, the technical part, the district, you know, made those decisions, but really the priorities, um, the community was, um, was really in, had a hand in leading the, the conversation. So we created this fair type atmosphere where we asked, um, you know, we had a passport where families and students came in and they got a stamp at each little, um, you know, booth that they uh, went in. And, and, and it wasn't explicit that we were asking, you know, what's a regenerative design vision statement for the school, but we broke it down to the scale of things that they could understand. Like, how do I feel like I belong? Where does that happen? What are my cultural values? How can how can the building express that? Um, how, if you had five uh, priorities and you wanted to tell the district what they were, what would they be? And in fact, in that last question, we gave students like five green dots and parents or adults or um, caregivers five blue dots, just to kind of understand, you know, at the end, were there differences in between students' preferences and adults' preferences? And the beautiful thing was, they had the same preferences. Oh, and, wow. I mean, it was it was wonderful. And you know what their top two preferences were about nature and play. So then we went back as a team and said, look, we need nature and play goals. And that's really what we need to support. And we created a regenerative design vision statement centered around nature and play. I mean, one of the things that I appreciate about this project is it the end result was something unanticipated at the start. And it was through with really good project partners and a really well-designed and thoughtful community engagement that you see you see the bigger picture play out in a way that you you just don't anticipate. So to end up with a regenerative vision statement thematically organized around nature and play and connections back to learning processes and human development, like it was just a really great way to see these things that are so important um, on a technical level combined with a human level. Um, meetings, community aspiration. It was, um, again, just a wonderful process to see play out because the net result was something so much more powerful than we what we thought we was going to be walking in from a pretty simple chartering question to a really um, powerful end result. So you, you asked earlier, um, who was the champion essentially of these projects? And I would say that um, as Tom did, that there wasn't one champion but that when we work together, um, we reach a better, you know, end result. Um, and it, I think it has to do with kind of the philosoph philosophical fit between what we believe at Cunningham and what the district believes. And what we say at Cunningham is we design with, not for. And I think that that is absolutely, and Tom, I don't think you say it the same way. But <laughs> How would you say it, Tom? Because yeah. it does sound like... You know, I'd say uh, I, I occasionally uh, borrow that phrase. It's certainly, you know, <laughs> succinct and, and, and conveys what we want to do. But I, I mean, again, I, I think for us, having having the intentionality, and, and it's not always easy from the um, the public agency side of things. Like it is, there's a lot of impediments to being able to do authentic stakeholder engagement well. Um, yeah. And I will never make claims that we have done it all perfectly all the time. Like that, that is always going to be a, a learning, um, something and in, in learning for us and learning in progress. Um, but, you know, being able to show commitment to this over time um, is really beneficial and creates the traction. You know, it is not, um, I, I, I want to be forthright. The fact that it, it's not something where everybody is excited to be at the table and knows exactly what they're doing there and why their voice matters and what they're going to contribute and whether it's worth prioritizing their time on a Tuesday evening or a Saturday. It's, these are things that folks um, might not have the, the, the basis in and being able to show intentionality around, you know, we're, we're not going to ask you anything that we don't want to, we don't plan on using in some way, you know, we're going to make this valuable for you even if it means changing our process for what we think we're going to, we're trying to get to and what that looks like and, tail, and trying to meet our stakeholders where they are and not where we would like them to be and bringing them to us as you know, said, we want to be going to where they are. Um, so this is something where being able to, over the last 10 years, be able to continue to build what this looks like, builds credibility, builds consistency, and builds capacity on our teams to be able to understand what it's going to take to, to get there. Because it's daunting standing at the press, you know, at the starting line of a project, um, trying to figure out how you're going to answer these things without 
necessarily having the relationships and community that you're gonna you know you're gonna have by the end but you don't have them at the start and what are the pieces that you're doing to sort of structure that engagement um, so that you know you're gonna you're confident that you're gonna get there so there there's two different questions that I want to tackle within there one is is getting that community involvement with a bigger district but then looking at a specific project and my follow-up is going to be about equity so don't don't let me forget about that piece of it when I when I come back to it. but that that first one like were you surprised like did you get the response from the stakeholders from the community that you expected was it more was it less than than what you were you thought or you were hoping for um I will speak from personal vantage point, not certainly not one of the school district, um, but, you know, from my perspective, coming from an architecture background and, you know, prior to working for the school district, I was at a firm. Um, I would, it, it took me a while to recalibrate um, what it would take to get people to meaningfully show up and what was the intentionality behind who was showing up. We wanted to be like, I, because I love this work, I assume that everyone does. And, you know, we say, hey, we want to list, talk to you about this. You just assume everyone's going to show up because you would. Um, and that's not realistic. And that's not what the expectation is of community. Um, but being able to understand, well, what does make this meaningful for people? And what does help them make this feel accessible and safe and valuable? Um, and I think is is something that that we're constantly trying to reassess. So yeah, there was a process for me to um, be able to um, understand what it was going to take to get people to the table and why did we want them there and what were we going to do with them while we were there? Um, because it's not field of dreams. We do not build and make up. Like th this is something <laughs> where we we really had to be intentional about this because um, there are so many ways that this good intention becomes inequitable in in how it gets articulated and, and happens in in practice so being thoughtful and again this is why the iap2 framework um is helpful for us to to be intentional about who our different stakeholders are and what are we what commitments are we making to them in this process and internally in the school district we do have a lot of great resources through say our office of family engagement and community partnerships um you know our uh parent advisory councils our school our student leadership groups you know we we do have some formalized structures that help us create um, some engagement and then help us get more into the informalized structures. But it is it is a stakeholder design and management is a um, really constant source of work um, for to, to keep doing this work. Yeah. So Tom, pizza helps. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That's so right. so the, the, the whole thing with the Bruce Vento engagement was it wasn't just about engaging in the school. It was a pizza night. It was it was a fun night already. People were already going to be at the school, so that's where this idea came from the team to create something fun. But, but yeah. we have also learned, like you know, we had the translators there as well, and um, other good things we've learned over the years is if if you need childcare um, to get people, what supports does your community need to get them there? Because um, then we'll take care of the rest once they're there. But but they also, I think the important thing too, one of the first questions we asked um, was, how do you want us to follow up as a, as a community? So we're going to engage, we're going to listen, um, but how do you know what's happening? And at Bruce Bento, the, the overwhelming response was, we'd like to see um, teaching and learning in action in the landscape throughout the building. And so it, it's not just, I want a letter, you know, or an update on a website. It's, I want to see these things happening in action. So we knew that was a priority too. And I, and I think that's a clear thing that teams should ask. How do you plan to show that when they say they, they want to see it? Is it more of like inviting them back through there? Is it that you're doing more video sharing on social media? Like what, what were those takeaways that turned into well, action items? Well, actually, so if I could share for a minute, we actually created a, a graphic about how you can utilize, this is a Bruce Bento site plan, but it's actually sort of an illustrated site plan and you could give it to anybody. So because there are so many languages spoken here, we wanted to make it uh, without words that you could just visually see all the learning trails that you could take. I mean, this is an amenity to the community, the neighborhood. You could see, you can use play and the design concept, like I said, it had play in nature, right? Um, had a learning trail throughout the school that weaved its way on the inside and outside. And we were inspired by um, different aspects of nature. And then we have um, there's a hill, a 39 foot hill running from the Northwest to Southeast. So we're actually capturing water with cisterns 
but also through the through the natural hill um, and seeing the learning the ways in which water runs on the site. So that's just one example of how um, we're showing that we've listened um, that the building should be in action. Very cool. Yeah, that helps the visual too. We'll make yeah, we'll make sure we share that for the people who are listening audio. We'll we'll share that. So so I want to come back to that equity piece because I think that's we're in an interesting time where I feel like philosophically, very few people are gonna like say equity, like every every student shouldn't have an opportunity to succeed. Like uh, I think don't want to overgeneralize, but for the most part, people want want to be in be in that situation where every student is set up for success. But what ends up happening, and I've seen that, I don't know if Meg and Heidi, you, you've seen it too, is that in a bigger district in particular, it stifles doing anything different because it holds on to this conversation. Well, we can't do it for this site or this school because all these other schools, we can't do it for all of those. Were there any types of like conversations or things around that? I think I think the framework that the district put in place with the vision and with the principles and with the standards um, allowed enough leeway so that it the schools could be designed to the needs of those particular stakeholders, essentially, um, with an idea that there is equity throughout. Um, Heidi, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the research and the stuff that you've been doing on trauma-informed design and how it played out in Bruce Santo, because I think that that is a really good equity story. There are six lenses in which we look at a project through trauma-informed design, and they are dignity and self-esteem, sense of community, beauty and meaning, stress management, empowerment and person control, and security, privacy, and personal space. And um, we are we intentionally designed um, Bruce Fento with those in mind. And I think that has an equity lens because while you can't design for, you know, probably every aspect, there are ways in which you can um, potentially reduce someone's stress, for example, um, throughout a space um, looking at, and so we use this lens of trauma-informed design to look at, well, how might we, um, you know, think about this through a lens of an introvert? How might we think about this through a lens of an extrovert? How might we get our wiggles out if we need um, that to happen? And so uh, I have another um, example where um, this is the informal learning at uh, Bruce Bento. And um, we intentionally designed each of our spaces to have an aspect of these six principles so that theoretically you could get your needs met regardless of what they were on each different space without having to leave the space. So there are principles set up while each of these colors um, relate to those six. Uh, principles through trauma-informed design. Um, and, and honestly, backing up, we actually um, tailored our, um, our surveys to teachers and to students and to staff um, utilizing the principles of, of these uh, six principles. Um, so we start to uh, get uh, qualitative type data that back, backs up our design um, before we even start to put pen to paper, if you will. But, but the other thing I wanted to mention for equity too, beyond that is um, what we uh, looked at specifically um, was we created an equity goal for the project as well as you know nine other goals that we use. This is the framework we ended up using for the regenerative design in which we have a nature and play goal. And one of the things we talked about was equitable communities and what would that mean? You know, St. Paul is a big city. And so one metric we used for an equitable community was looking at the tree score. Um, and so the existing school at Bruce Fento doesn't have very many trees at all. It's kind of a heat island, actually, in its existing. Um, and we looked at um, what would be, what is a tree score in other um, more affluent areas of St. Paul um, and created a goal based on that. And our, we have a tree goal um, to create an equitable community. That's a tree equity. Org or com. But I mean, we looked at like, equity from multiple lenses. Yeah, Tom, I, yeah, share like how that's viewed in, in the district and in the city when they see a school. It is that conversation, that equity of like, hey, they're getting that, but I'm not over here. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we have 73 different campuses. You know, I think our portfolio is valued somewhere north of $3.1 billion. I mean, we're a huge organization with a lot of different buildings and each one has its own unique needs and each, each not just each building is different, but each community is different. And we wanted to 
understand and and figure out a way to work that into our our planning process. So so I'll point to two things in this conversation. One more um, behavioral and process, and then the other slightly more technical. Um, prior to our master planning process, we asked, um, not asked, we required um, all of the seven firms that were assisting us in the master planning process to go through 16 hours of um, equity training. And we, uh, with the explicit goal of making sure that conversations about race, about gender, about poverty, um, were not excluded from the planning process. We're not shut down by good intentions, but bad execution. Um, we wanted to, our, our design teams to be extensions of our organization. And our organization is heavily committed to um, equity and especially racial equity. Um, so being able to provide a consistent foundation, a condition, consistent training, um, an expectation for everybody attached to the master planning process to make sure that we were living up to that ideal was was critical for just to get out of um, the starting blocks for for engaging with community. Um, one of the things that, you know, that helps us do and helps us stay consistent of as we look at sort of that stakeholder engagement framework is um, being intentional about um, letting community design what community engagement looks like um, so that we, we ask people, you know, to Heidi's point earlier, how do you want to hear your feedback? How do you want to know that we've we've taken what you've given us and done something valuable with it? Um, what does that look like for you? Um, how can we show up to where you are versus asking you to come to us? Um, and one of the things we did with our district level group during the master planning process was, well, if we understand that we are a multi-billion dollar organization, um, how, we have to recognize we can't do everything all at once. So how do we prioritize? So that that group actually was the one that created a prioritization structure for us that allowed us to um, disaggregate all the different things we'd like to do and um, you, you know and, and would love to be able to do in an ideal world, but knew we wouldn't have the resources for, so that we could then um, meaningfully and transparently start to prioritize work and say, here's why we're going to work over here for a little bit. Here's why we'll be here next, and you know what that that could potentially be. So. Um, you know, we've got a visual that I can share really quickly just so you can see it. Um, you know, it was a way for us to look at, you know, the different ways that the community had us prioritize the work um, around um, what's what's valuable for our community access and learning spaces and all these pieces to graphically quantify it, have it translate into a, a prioritization of whether we're going to work in this building over that building, and have that be something that we have up on our website. Everyone can see we update it annually um, and have this consistent recurring way to, to continue to prioritize work. Uh, St. Paul Public Schools is different than most in that we are not um, necessarily a go out to the voters once for a bond referendum with a set defined scope of work. We have uh, statutory authority that allows us to have an ongoing program year over year. That means everything is constantly, um, you know, we're always on looking on the horizon for you know, what's next and how do we keep moving this work forward in a meaningful and sustainable way. Uh, so this has been a great tool for us to understand. We want to have a really big impact. How are we prioritizing the, the time and dollars to do that in a way that means we're going we're gonna to reach an end at some point and have this good permeate the whole city? Yeah. So that's really interesting to hear how that funding mechanism, is that something that's that's governed by the district or is that something by the state? Like for, for other districts that are listening to this, because that is like, honestly, like probably one of the biggest keys to success is the fact that you do have authority to use the funds as needed instead of saying, Hey, we put this out to ballot eight years ago and now we have to do exactly what we said was on there. Yeah. Um, and so this is, this is authority through the state legislature. Um, it's for, it's unique to every school district or slightly different to every school district. You know, St. Paul Public Schools is part of the Council of Great City Schools, which is the largest, I think, 68 urban school districts in the country. Um, so we see variations of this across the country in terms of what that looks like. Um, but I absolutely agree. You know, the ability to have dependable long-range funding um, as a means to make meaningful progress that that isn't just focused on um, 
you know, the next four years. Um, you know, we like to say we're, we're short-term stewards of long-term assets. You know, we, mm-hmm. uh, we're, my tenure with the school district is uh, just a blip in the 150 year history um, of this organization and of the communities we serve. So what are we doing for the benefit that's going to be coming true long after we've, we've left? I wanted to add to another thing the district is doing from an equity lens is the inclusive restrooms. So each time a project is is um, is done, you are putting in inclusive restrooms in that in that transformation, right, Tom? Yep. Well, and and so as we talk, I mean, again, this is to, to weave two themes together. I mean, this is stakeholder engagement um, meets planning meets equity long term. I mean, this was something where it was during the master planning process we we had a very straightforward plumbing piping replacement project at one of our high schools. You know, the things we do all the time, the bread and butter work of keeping buildings, you know, clean, safe, and dry, um, you know, going through and just replacing supply and waste piping in a building. And when we do that, you know, we replace the plumbing fixtures at, at the end of the run. And as we were having these conversations around long-term visioning for our facilities um, and started working with the student leadership group at this particular high school, the, the students started sharing stories with us and, and started talking about the real outsized role that going to the bathroom plays in high school and, you know, the, the, the social dynamics, the safety perception, the, the ways that this can be a negative contributor to a student's day. Um, and in, in the planning of this process, you, you know, our mandate was just to replace some piping and we're saying, can we in good faith actually do that? Can we can we just put this thing back knowing the problems that we are having? And this is this is not living up to who we think we should be. And so using that same student leadership group, um, being able to design what what does a bathroom that treats you with respect, that you feel safe and that you feel respected and what does that look like? And what are the what are the human behaviors we need to do to reinforce that in addition to just the bricks and mortar changes? Um, and that's been hugely successful and very well uh, received by the staff and students at the the 14 plus buildings we've now um, installed these in. And and it's and it's been a great success story for understanding what happens when you listen to students and respect, you know, show them the respect that they deserve and in return they respect the the physical environment um, as their own. And you know, some of the research we're doing now that we hope to publish here in the next year or so is going to hopefully show just the real difference it makes in terms of students feeling safe, minimization of negative behaviors like vandalism, um, and just a general sense of how do we think differently about learning environments beyond the oftentimes industrial foundation of what public schools looked like for the last hundred years. At the high school level, it was really about, I mean, part of that was kids were hydrating themselves so they didn't have to use the bathroom um, at, at uh, that high school. But, it, you know, we did, we implemented them at an elementary school early on, St. Anthony Park Elementary. And I remember the teachers being a little skeptical. Well, why, why would we need that here? And what they found after the, the um, inclusive toilets were completed was that they actually gained uh, teaching and learning time in the day because it took kids less time to go potty in these particular um, inclusive toilet types. You know, so it's there are um, benefits that come out of really taking this sort of um, listening and and implementing it in a in a thoughtful way. And um, Heidi's been really um, a part of that documentation and research process um, with the district. Um, for quite some time now. Yeah, we actually did a post-occupancy survey um, of that school. Tom was talking about their first school, Johnson High School, in which the inclusive restrooms were um, implemented. And a a year after they were were implemented, we came back and surveyed all 1,200 students. We got about 850 responses, and the responses were that 61% felt more safe in the inclusive restrooms, 30% didn't notice, and only 9% um, didn't feel safe. And um, the, honestly, with that 9%, I had, um, I looked at all 850 responses, and a lot of them were about, um, you know, pointing the finger at boys and girls being more dirty than the other as their perception of safety. But I think that's that's huge um, that uh, 91% either felt more safe or didn't even notice the difference. And I think 
that's a big deal because we're, what we're asking students to do is take risks in their learning, right? And so if if they aren't getting their basic needs met and not feeling safe or just something of going to the bathroom, then how are they how are they expected to take those risks in their learning environment? And so this is actually just a, a huge transformation um, for the district in in something as as little right as restrooms. Yeah, can you can you describe what you ended up doing, and and was it the same at elementary, middle school, high school? Was it kind of across the board? What do, what did those actually look like? Ah, uh, that's a great question. So we actually do have I have a um, SPPS prototype, um, and essentially what they are, are private compartments or private rooms with a toilet inside of the rooms, and they have a full height uh, walls with acoustic insulation. They have sort of standard doors. Um, and then they have uh, an open, shared, very visible um, hand washing area. So that's the prototype. Um, the important thing we learned for that uh, feeling of safety and security was um, the dual indicator locks that show that the, the compartment is locked from both the outside and the inside was the number one indicator for people feeling that they felt safe. Um, but there actually is some differentiation in the um, St. Paul model between elementary school and middle and high school. And that is in the elementary school, there is no sort of windows or full height wall above the hand washing area. It's really much more open. But in the middle and high school model, there is a, a wall with visibility still um, just for more um, privacy for the middle and high school ages. But that's essentially the major difference between the two. And for the districts that are hearing this and saying, because th this doesn't always have to be something that has comes under a big bond program or anything like this. These are things that just like school leaders can take the initiative to change. To do this versus kind of the traditional cost-wise, did you guys look at that and see like how how much of a difference that was? We did. And, and it is unequivocally, it is more expensive to do this than a traditional multi-stall restroom. Um, one of our learnings early on in the Johnson project that I was surprised by was the fact that um, the spatial footprint didn't change. To go okay. from a gendered multi-stall bathroom to an inclusive um, single occupant restroom, same footprint. That was that was a surprise to me in this process. Um, but for us, you know, again, I think the the benefit to the students and to the learning process um, and just to the overall functioning of a building. Um, made that cost premium worthwhile for us. Yeah. You know, it's an exciting time in the state of Minnesota in that the state legislature just passed a law that created a funding source for all school districts across the state to do explicitly this. Um, and so that's opened up a whole new resource, I think, because of, um, I think, the the benefit that they're seeing for, for students. And, um, you know, we uh, appreciate that this is not just a single issue benefit. This is across the board good design raising the tide for all kids yeah. yeah but you're right i mean i have a brother who's a middle school principal and he's like every issue always comes back to the bathrooms it's always about the bathrooms wow. the the one other thing that i'm just going to mention like in this realm um and i didn't think we would talk this much about bathrooms so we'll come back to the the community stuff too but um there's also a movement to make sure that period products are available for free in each of those in there. And I, I have a friend who's been one of the leaders in that with, with her company and flow of, of saying like, why if we are putting in, you know, like the district's paying for toilet paper and paper towels, like why do we not have this? Because that is obviously an area where, yeah, I mean, it could really ruin, some, ruin some's day if, uh, if they don't have access. You know, so uh, as of January 1, uh, 2024, here in Minnesota, we are, the, every school district in the state is going to uh, start providing free period products for all students in grades 4 through 12. Um, so for us being able to, because you're, you're absolutely right, this is about what, is it, what are your needs? What, what's the way that this becomes a spot where you get where you get what you need and you can go back to learning and it's and it's uh, something that meets you where you are um yeah exactly that was just that, the yeah. logical extension of it yeah 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 and just think of like the old way of like how it has been done to be like well oh, if you didn't have like a quarter or two quarters like for the for a machine like just how crazy to think like mm -hmm. whenever that started it's still been going on <laughs> 
All right. Well, I know we're, I appreciate your time. I know we're, 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 we're going to the end here. I, I want to hear as we're kind of wrapping up, like, what are you most excited to kind of see? I know this project we were talking about, um, it sounds like it's 2025 completion. Is that the plan? What, what are you guys most excited about? I mean, I'll say the, the, the things that keep me as excited about this work as I am is the benefit that we get to see, um, not just when we have the ribbon cutting and these really great spaces are unveiled, but the process that gets us to that point is so edifying. There is so much incredible input and incredible thought by community and professionals and everyone, like everyone involved in this has a big voice um, and being able to weave all those pieces together is rarely easy, but the benefit in the moment and the benefit long-term is enormous. Um, so seeing the transformation that's possible when you start to think big and start to think with sort of a design design mindset around what's the possibility and how do we how do we understand what the real opportunity is at a moment is just um so so much fun to be part of so it's great to see this and each success builds more success and the ability to keep doing this in a way that again takes our takes what we've done and keeps pushing it yeah. forward every year yeah, it's that multiplying effect. That mm -hmm. is so cool to see is that, yeah, this is going to inspire other things in your district, but then also into other districts around the country too. My favorite day is the, the day that kids come back to school after their building's been remodeled um, because they're just like, they just are stunned. It's like, oh, wow, look at that. Wow. <laughs> it's absolutely my favorite day, any day of the week. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. I think the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is we talked about in that workshop, I talked about, you know, how do you see your community, how you see your cultural values show up. Um, and I'm excited. And, and a lot of the conversation we talked about was, and I just don't see myself here yet in this building. How do I see myself there? And so I want to see how they see themselves in this new school. And here, as Meg was saying, the words are talking about how they're using it. I'm just so excited for that day. Yeah. Well, Meg, Heidi, Tom, thank you so much for your time going through. So I know we hit a lot of things in there. So for the listeners, there will be things on the show notes and wherever you're listening, you can just hit subscribe for future episodes. But if you go to betterlearningpodcast.com, that's where we'll have more of the details in here. And then we also have a survey on there that is really meant to spur some action. We talk about kind of all the things that are going on, trying to connect these silos that usually aren't talking um, within education, whether it's space or leadership or the or uh, the community, I think we hit all of it in in this conversation here of trying to connect all of those silos so that that we are making better decisions for for to to make the improvement that we want and see in education. So, but if you can go to go there, that's where other resources can be. And if you can take that survey, it will it will uh, prompt you into some things that kind of align into action. So some where your interests and where where your skill sets and your gifts are, there are different things that you can take from there so that we are we are not just talking about it, we're actually doing it. Thank you, all three. Appreciate Thank it. You, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.